Fantastic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-stage paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. And good evening and welcome to the Phantasmic Journey Podcast. We are coming to you live from the PGH Studios here in downtown Paducah, Kentucky. I am your host, Gavin Kelly, and sitting right next to me is my lovely wife, which is my co-host, Paula Kelly. Syndication is brought to you by Live 365 and iHeartRadio. You can listen live via the web. By going to http colon slash slash streaming dot live 365 dot com slash a zero 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 three six or the easy way if you have an iPhone just go to the app store search for live 365 uh, install it run it search for WGKC today's hottest country the same thing goes for if you have an Android phone go to the Google Play Store search for the live 365 app install it and run it search for WGKC today's hottest country. Now, I bet you're wondering why WGKC, today's hottest country. Well, to answer that question, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., I am the DJ for the country radio station. Pretty cool, huh? Well, let's not get too sidetracked here. Um, Tonight, we have an awesome guest. He began his paranormal career with his wife, Melanie, in 2008 investigating local areas on the East Coast. When started as a simple curiosity, developed into extreme interest and passion in the paranormal investigations. He founded an investigative team, Breaking Paranormal, in 2011, with a hand-picked team to investigate reported haunted locations across the country. While working with Breaking Paranormal, he founded the American Ghost Hunters Show, a live stream currently airing on Paranormal Warehouse. He has interviewed countless paranormal celebrities and experts and is highly regarded in the paranormal field. You can catch our guests traveling all over the country as the co-lead investigator with Ghost Hunters on A&E. I am talking about the one and only Daryl Martson. How you doing this evening, Daryl? What's going on, guys? Hey, what's going on? What's going on? Not much, man. Just happy to be on your show. Uh, can't wait to get started. What's going on now? Uh, not much. We're just hanging in here, doing our self quarantine, basically. Um, <laughs> this uh, <laughs> like the rest of the world, huh? <laughs> oh, I know, right? The coronavirus has basically taken over, and it's just one heck of a pandemic that's going on. But. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about everything paranormal because that's what we do. (laughs) And I I have my lovely co-host next to me, Paula Kelly. Hello, everybody. So, we just uh, have some standard questions that we always ask our guests. And um, I'm going to let her start it off. So, when did you become interested in the paranormal? 
Um, I, I, quite honestly, I was always interested in you know, even as a kid. I mean, I didn't know what a ghost hunter or a paranormal investigator was then, but um, when the, all these shows started coming out in the early 2000s, that's when I really started, you know, looking at them. And quite honestly, I mean, I never thought about being an investigator or a ghost hunter or whatever you want to call it at that point. Um, I, act, I actually accidentally got into uh, investigating um, the first time. Uh, it was probably around 2005 or six. I actually got invited to a local paranormal uh, investigation at uh, Fort Delaware. And um, mm. to tell you the truth, I uh, went, and it was like a two-and-a-half-hour, two-and-a-half, three-hour thing. I didn't know what to expect. You know, I thought maybe at that point it was just a bunch of, you know, nonsense. And, right. I went, yeah, nothing would happen. And i tell you what, man, I, I got hooked. I was hooked. And I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted to do it, and I, I didn't know how I was going to do it. I know, didn't know anything about it. Didn't know anything about the equipment and all that stuff. I started watching all the shows and you know all that good stuff. And um, that's when um, I started doing it locally. I, I met my wife at the time we were dating, and um, then we just started doing it like at local places like Gettysburg because I'm literally about two hours from Gettysburg. And mm-hmm. We go all the time. And Fort Delaware, of course, that's like literally in my backyard, you know, out in the uh, Delaware River. And um, then I, you know, I formed uh, Breaking Paranormal around 2011 or so and met some really good people out of Ohio and mm-hmm. um, started doing a lot of stuff out there and uh, started you know, doing some traveling, you know, like Kentucky, Ohio, mm-hmm. all over Pennsylvania, New York, Maryland, you name it. And, um, did a lot of really cool investigating in a lot of really cool places. And then um, got interested in doing some uh, podcast stuff. I started out on YouTube. I did that for about a year or so. Mm-hmm. I remember starting out, you know, having like five or six, you know, people watching. Actually, I think you were a guest on my show at that time. Yeah. Back on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's been about three or four years ago now. And, um then I got into doing some like celestial radio stuff uh, for about seven or eight months. Didn't really care for that too much. Then I uh, got hit up by a parallel warehouse, and um, anybody knows those guys, man, they're they're top notch. And um, when it comes to live streams and stuff, so mm. got into doing live streams, the American Ghost Hunter Show, and uh, man, it just took off from there. And here I am now, man. I got the phone call and. I went out to L.A. and did my thing, and um, next thing I know, I'm on the road filming with all these great people, uh, you know, like Brandon and Mustafa, Brian, Rochelle, Kristen, mm-hmm. all of them, Grant, and uh, just having a great time investigating, traveling, you know, all over the country, and, and um, man, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing ride. We just wrapped season two about three or four weeks ago, and uh, just waiting for it to come out now. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally excited. I believe it's, what, April 8th? It's going to be out on A&E? Yes. April 8th uh, comes out at 8 p.m. It's a Wednesday night. Uh, it's a two-hour special, um, 8 to 10. And I tell you what, man, I, I've actually seen this episode already. Uh, we were at, we saw the rough copy of it. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, man, I'm blown away. Uh, th- this season is just – it's it's a whole different ball game. It's, it's not it's, – it takes a totally different direction. We're doing places that are very remote, Um and have never been done before, all except for maybe one of them mm-hmm. is an actual location that you've seen on TV. It's a huge location. People were asking us to go back, so we went back, and it didn't let us down. We came up, we came out with some really cool stuff that uh, never has been captured there before. Mm-hmm. But um, these locations we're doing are just off the charts. They're very, very active locations. And you got to figure, I mean, th- these people are calling us in to these places. These are owners and and people like you know that are in um like state you know state politicians and city politicians that are calling us in to investigate these locations because of the activity and we're going there and we're bringing new equipment that's never been seen in the field before Mm -hmm. and we're using it and working and we're capturing the stuff and it's just amazing It's, it's i'm so blown away by season two it's probably the proudest I've been in all these years doing investigating of uh, anything I've done. And basically you guys might actually have the answers for questions that we have been asking, possibly in season two? I'm sorry, say that again, what's that? 
I'm saying that you guys are probably going to have the answer to some of our question within yeah, season I, two yeah. that a lot of people have been asking throughout the years because I believe you guys are going to uncover something that's going to be totally compelling. Yes, there is some very compelling evidence. I, it's one thing you this, about this show, and it kind of separates from a lot of the other shows, especially season two, mm-hmm. um, is we're actually making ground. We're really making ground. We're not just going in and saying, oh, your house is on it. This is what you got to do. This is who it is. No, mm-hmm. we are breaking ground. We are sh- going to show evidence in season two of things that people didn't think were act were or you were able to capture. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just mind blowing. It's mind blowing. I think I sit here and I think about it right now and the things we we capture. I'm, I'm a little numb to it now because we we did it for so long, mm-hmm. but. Thinking back on it, it's just like, oh, my God, I can't believe we actually caught that with this piece of equipment. Or we uh, we have – there's I know you had Brandon on the show a week or so ago. Yeah. And I'm sure he said he, he, you know, he kind of told a little bit about it, but there's a new piece of equipment we're using that Brandon was able to reach out to some, some friends mm-hmm. uh, in the field. And um, and I'll tell you what, this, this new piece of equipment, this new camera that we're using <laughs> – it's 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 amazing. It's amazing, and I tell you what, people are just going to be stunned, and they're going to be not just stunned by the evidence we capture, but by these locations and how active they are. And, mm-hmm. and you're going to have a lot of people wanting to go to them. I tell you, it's going to be hard because some of these locations are way way off the map. I mean, there's <laughs> one that, there's one we did in Alaska that literally took me like 12 or 13 hours of flying and a four hour boat ride to get to. So oh. yeah. <laughs> and all that equipment too, at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All the equipment, you know, you got a whole crew of, of, of producers and cameramen and audio and everybody else producers and all that. And you plus us and mm-hmm. you got to get all that there. But uh, it's, Believe me, guys, when you watch season two, you're going to be like, this is a completely different. It, this is more than just a paranormal show anymore. We keep saying that, but we can't stress it enough. It's oh, more than a paranormal show. <laughs> it's just, it's mind blowing. I just, and we thank A&E uh, for, you know, giving us the platform to show it on because I tell you, man, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to change a lot of things in the field. Well, I know I do have a couple of questions that some people have been asking me because they were like totally freaked out. They're like, "You're gonna have Daryl on your show?" I'm like, "Yeah." Well, ask him how in the <laughs> how did he actually land the ghost hunter position? I mean, did he have to go through like uh, uh, interviews, fill out emails, have Skype meetings? I mean, how did he do it? I'm like, I don't know. I'll ask him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, all all that and above. Um, I, I actually, I actually got a phone call one night. I was, it's a story I've told many times. I was about seven o'clock at night. I'm sitting in my kitchen with my seven year old son playing Nerf guns. <laughs> and I get the phone call and I'm looking at, I'm like, I didn't recognize it. It was from California. And it said, maybe Pilgrim Media. I'm like, where do I know that name from? I didn't even answer it. I just let it go to voicemail. Right. And they left, they left a message and I picked it up. And uh, I remember the, it was a, a, one of the producers, his name's Nick. He's mm-hmm. like, Hey, you know, we want to interview you um, for this position on a, a new paranormal show. If you're interested, give me a call. So we played phone tag a couple of days, finally got, you know, back, you know, started doing some Skype meetings. And next thing I know, I'm being flown out to LA and, meeting people and producers and and executive producers and doing all kinds of tests and stuff like that and mm-hmm. uh then uh they send me back home and then i get a phone call saying hey you got the job you um you re- you ready to start filming i'm like yeah so when we going out like a month or so oh no you start uh you start uh sunday oh, and it was a geez. monday all right <laughs> <laughs> i i literally had a week to get everything together in my life le- less than a week Oh, man. And I know uh, you guys have been really racking up them frequent flyer miles, that's for sure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that and hotel points and everything else. Yeah, because uh, I believe Brandon said that you guys um, has at least flown over 120 flights or something like that? Uh, 
a lot. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of support. I don't. I I lost count. That's not even including like the the flights we take for events and stuff of that nature. Right. Um. You know, you got to fly to an event or something. But I mean, dude, it's just it's it's been crazy. It's it's like it, you you live on airplanes. Yep. Um Live on airplanes and hotels and riding in SUVs and getting to locations. And now we're home for a while and. It's uh, it's actually it felt pretty good to kind of be in one place and not moving. Right. <laughs> no kidding. So, what was your most frightening experience on an investigation? Most frightening experience on an investigation on the show, or oh, just in general. It could uh, be in general or in the show. In general, um, I've had some crazy ones on the show, uh, especially in season two. Um, there's been some some things that happened in season two, uh, like we were in Alaska. I can't, I don't want to give away too much, um, but we were in Alaska and um, I was investigating a building and sitting in the hallway and just staying there and, and something I couldn't see with my own eyes charged down the hallway at me and basically it, it, it rushed me. And it rushed me so it, you could feel this this the air and the force of it. And basically I jumped back into a room, almost knocked Mustafa down and, uh, put, we captured some really cool stuff on my body cam from that. When that happened, you guys will see that in the show. Um, it's going to oh, be well, amazing. Oh, wow. You guys are wearing body cams. Oh yeah. Yeah. Body cams. That's, oh, I love body cams. Body that's cams are so <laughs> great due to the fact that you can just put them on, turn them on and you forget about them. They're just there. Is it the one that's like on your chest or on your shoulder, yeah, on your yeah, head? It's, it's, it's just like the ones uh, police officers use. Oh, okay. Um, uh, you put, you just, you can hook it on your your shirt, your coat, wherever, your belt buckle, wherever you want to put it. You can hook it, <laughs> and you just turn it on. It, it's got great audio. It's got great um, the pixelation on it is amazing. Oh, wow. um, the IR is amazing. Um, it, it, I mean, police use them all the time, so right. they got to be pretty good. Yeah. So everybody on the team wears the body cams? Um, it's your choice. Um, I always wear one, uh, just due to the fact that the stuff that I capture on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, that means I'm hands free, you know, so I can carry a piece of equipment or a hand cam or something else and, and not have to, uh, not have to worry about anything else but that. Hmm. Okay. That sounds interesting. Have to check that out. Body oh, cams. Yeah. <laughs> what was your uh, What was your first location you ever investigated? Uh, first, well, it'd be Fort Delaware. Uh, the first place I've ever investigated. Yes, Fort Delaware. I got invited to it. Um, I talked about that earlier, and um, I really didn't do too much investigating because I was very green and I didn't know what to expect. Um, but. Uh, then I went back a couple more times over the years and um, investigated again. And then I think the first time I ever really, really got deep into it where I had my own equipment and everything would probably be Gettysburg. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went out there and did some investigating. Um, it was with my, um, my girlfriend at the time, who is my wife now. And um, we went out there and we actually ran a B and B that was supposedly very active and had a lot of cool stuff happen. Uh, so yeah, it took a lot of cool pictures, caught a lot of stuff on, 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 you know, on camera out there. So we were out there for a good, I don't know, four or five days. Oh, yeah. wow. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I know the thing about with Gettysburg, it is so highly concentrated with, uh, it's saturated more like with paranormal activity. I mean, we, when we were there for uh, the Battlefield Bash last year, we actually went down to or to Blood Creek, I think it was. Blood Creek, yeah. And on my thermal, I saw what looked like somebody walking toward us. And there's nobody else out there except for me, Paula, uh, Evelyn, and these two guys that joined us. And all of a sudden, we can see on the thermal that there is somebody walking toward us over that creek. And when I shine the flashlight down there, there's nobody there, which is really bizarre. I'm shining the flashlight. Nobody's there. But look back in the thermal, and there he is. 
I'm like, oh yeah, thermals are awesome. We <laughs> use them on the show all the time. Oh yeah, I mean, love them. And then we started yeah. using a a weird app that she'd been using. I know. I don't think you guys use any phone apps on the show, right? No, correct. Okay. Um, the reason we don't, and we don't, we don't want to knock anybody's stuff. We don't want to say, yeah, don't use this. Don't. Mm-hmm. It, that's up to anybody who wants to use that stuff. We right. can't use it through the fact we have an actual client. Mm-hmm. That at the end of the day, we have to take all our evidence we compile and say, hey, this is what we captured. We can't take a phone app to them and say, oh, look. A ghost said something on a phone app, or <laughs> yeah, we can't. We we use EVPs. We use a lot of visual footage, um, like for our body cams from mm-hmm. this new camera uh, Brandon has brought in. Um, thermal. We've had a lot of cool thermal hits. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we've used. So yeah, we use a lot of that type of stuff at the end of the day, and that's that's the type of stuff you gotta. Yeah, we gotta be able to sit down with clients. And say, look, we caught this on a Zoom 6 audio recorder or an Amazonic or a binaural um, audio recorder, mm-hmm. which are some of the best audio recorders in the field. Oh, it is. Um, and, and this is what we captured. We captured this voice saying this. Uh, so, yeah. So, we, I, I don't knock any of that stuff. If you want to use it, you want to use your SLSs and your spirit boxes, go right ahead. We just can't use them on the show because, like I said, we have a client and our client needs actual factual evidence. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we were just using it just to see what we would get, and I mean, the answers that we got while we were there in Gettysburg it actually correlated to the area where we were. You know, just someone was actually shot. He was hurt. He was wounded. He's bleeding. I'm like, wow, that is just okay. Cool. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. We've we've captured stuff like that out there before. Um, we um, did some EVPs and stuff out in the battlefield. Um, and caught some really crazy stuff out there. Just you know, over the years, anytime you go out there, I mean, it's amazing. You're gonna you're gonna get something. You never come away from Gettysburg um, empty-handed. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen those videos where they supposedly show an apparition walking toward a cannon in Gettysburg? Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. Is it real or is it fake? That I couldn't tell you. I'd have to actually see the actual footage um, and what came from, what kind of camera it came from, mm-hmm. and run it through the, the, the gamut and kind of. The spectral analyzer. <laughs> I've, only, I've only seen it on shows. Yeah. Because yeah. I've been seeing a, a, a bunch of videos coming out of <laughs> Gettysburg, and one of them was that guy that actually walked through a cannon. And then there was this other one where it showed where you heard a loud pop, and then you see a ball of light, and next thing you know, you start seeing figures walking out through the trees. Oh. That one blew my mind. Yeah. I saw that one. Yeah, that one I do believe has been put through a lot of testing, and I, from what I hear, that what they, they, can't, they, they, they can't say it's not fake. Right. So... I do think that one is definitely real. I, and believe me, I've seen a lot of cool evidence come out of Gettysburg. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you, you kind of shake your head at it, like, eh, and then there's other times, like, okay, yeah, it, that that looks, that that fits the description that, you know, and it just looks, it looks legit. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, the thing that I kind of thought was weird, and I guess it really means that there is something there, is when you hear that loud pop, and then you see uh, like a ball of light. It's kind of like they kind of pop through the veil to come into our time, I'm assuming. The pop is when like the rift opens and then you see the ball of light when they actually come through. And next thing you know, boom, there's an apparition coming out. Yeah, yeah. I, um, you're going to see some really cool stuff like that in season two. Sweet. Um, yeah, you're going to see some stuff that that I've actually seen with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, I mean, I could talk about season one. Uh, we, we did an investigation in season one. Uh, we were in Louisiana at a plantation, and um, it was me, Brandon, Grant, and Mustafa doing an investigation. And we had to, this, this room we were in, was, it just was going off the charts. The whole second, sto- uh, second floor of this, this house was just 
going crazy. Hmm. Um, and then Brandon, myself, and Grant both saw this flash of light in the room next to us, mm-hmm. and this figure walk out of it and then walk back into it. And we all saw it. with our, Three of us saw it out of the four of us with our own eyes. Yeah. But um, you didn't hear a pop, though, was, right? Was, but, um, I don't remember if we heard a pop or not. Uh, I just know everything's like all our equipment was going off, our mm-hmm. data recorders, tri field meters, everything was going off at the same time, and we we're like, "What in the hell is going on?" <laughs> and then we see we see this this shadowy figure go across the room, and then this flash of light, and the whole room lit up, and then this figure come out of the light and kind of go back into the light, and the light disappeared, and like we're we sitting there trying to wrap our heads around for hours trying to mm-hmm. figure out what in the hell did we just see. Now, in season two, we're actually able to document some of this stuff with this this new equipment we're using, which is amazing because we're actually, we actually seen this before, and now we're able to document it in season two, which right. is awesome. Now, since you guys are using the, the binaural ears... Um, people can actually buy that. Is this new camera going to be consumer made, uh, con- consumer ready for like people can actually purchase this camera, or is it something that's uh, kind of uh, a prototype? Uh, this is a camera that has been used in the scientific field for many, many, many years, okay. um, and basically it was given to, it was loaned to us to say, hey, see what you can catch capture with paranormal with us. Hmm. This is what this these these people were like, hey, these are scientists and engineers who are interested in the paranormal, but they don't want to put their names on just yet. Right. They're like, okay, you guys are the ghost hunters. You you are the the, the show who for all those years have been backing stuff like this. So here mm-hmm. run with them, see what you can find. And then we're capturing these things with this particular uh piece of equipment mm-hmm. and then we're sending the our we're sending our evidence back to them saying, is this, this, is this a natural occurrence? You just try to feel them out and see what they say. And mm-hmm. then they look at it for a few days and goes back and forth. And they like, their final decisions are like, we don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> we've been using that camera. We've been using that piece of equipment for 30 years. And I've never seen anything like that. Oh, wow. So then it makes you scratch your head. You're like, okay. So is this piece of equipment going to be, um, able to purchase, I'm sure people are going to try to. Oh God, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, it's it. I can tell you, we we priced them out and we looked at them, and you can't. The thing is, you can't find them. <laughs> uh, but when you do find them, they're you're talking tens and tens of thousands of dollars. Man. Yeah, I think the cheapest one we were able to find was around sixty-five, seventy grand. Oh, wow. Yeah, because uh, you know how it is. Once you have a new piece of equipment showing up on the show, people are going to be like, oh, i got to have it. You know, because ever yeah. since you, you had yeah. the... Uh... Yeah, the thing with this... yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, what I was the saying is, this... is ever since yeah, you guys this... showed the binaural ears, there's been so many people trying to find that. I mean, I started seeing it on eBay. People were starting to sell it for, like, buku bucks because... It's now a high commodity because it's actually being seen on your show, and a lot of people are like, "I gotta have it." Yeah, yeah, um, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, the binaural and the Amazon. I love. I mean, I love both those pieces of equipment. And I have a. I went out and purchased a, a Zoom Six that I use on the show. You, you'll see me using it sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I I love that too. I mean, and, and those are all like reasonably priced, and you can. If you're willing to pay, you know, the money for them, and you can get them, you off like Amazon or straight through Zoom. Right. Um, yeah, there's there's some of this new equipment we're using that I don't know if it's going to be that easy for people to go out. This is not <laughs> something that's made. This is the thing that was this. This is not something that's made in somebody's garage, and it's not something that's made mass produced. Right. It's made for a certain a certain science, and it's made to um, for you know certain people to, who use it. Um, and these, and they use it. One of these, you know, they use these cameras for, for what they're doing in their field. Um, and I tell you, it'll all come out in April 8th. You guys will see it. Um, all the hype 
and you'll you'll know what it is at that point and what it's called. And um, hey, somebody can mass produce one. Let me know. <laughs> I don't know. There might be. So, have you um, ever worked with a, a strange or weird case, or a location for that matter, that uh, you really didn't have an answer to? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've had some stuff, even on the show, we've run into, I mean, cases where, I mean, season two, I mean, season one was was was, was hard, don't be wrong. It was really hard. We had a, there was a lot of work and. But season two is a whole other animal, um, mm-hmm. and there's some stuff we we we. It took all of us together to put our heads together and say, "What, what is this? And how do we, how do we deal with this? And how do we, we present this to the client?" Um, and I can't tell you too much about that stuff. Oh, I know. I can tell you some of the stuff that happened. You know, a, you know, a case I worked on that wasn't on the show. Um, been about five or six years ago now that uh wasn't actually a case it was actually a place i investigated i wasn't helping a client or anything but um i scratch my head to this day wondering what i i kind of know what's going on in this building um and it's well known at this point that there's actually there's satanic worshiping and stuff like that that's going on in this build this this particular building Mm -hmm. um and this building was uh very active um it's 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 the only place I can actually say I've ever been to that the building itself felt like its own entity. Ooh, okay. um, like it was alive, and when you walked through those, through those doors, or you even pulled up to that property, you could feel the energy from it. Um, and it wasn't a good energy; it was a bad energy. Um, but there is some stuff. Well, there's been a lot of murders there. So really, it's been a really bad spot in Cleveland, um, and place is just very active and it's one of those places you you, you just feel like when you, you walk out of there you've got to just just douse yourself in, <laughs> in holy water or something man because I tell you it just, it just sticks to you and it follows you home and it takes a while you talking about paranormal hangover man mm-hmm. that is that's like having the paranormal flu because it just <laughs> hangs on you for weeks at a time and then you you start just thinking about it all the time and all the time. it's just, it's crazy it's a crazy location sounds like the house of wills exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the one yep <laughs> i've had a lot of friends that go there and when they come out of there they are all messed up yeah not the, you're not the same after that i went in there when i went in there i was, I was, I was I've been investigating for a while at that point, but I was, I was I was very cocky, I think, and it knew it. It, it reads people, man. It's it's weird. It's a weird situation. It it place can read you. Oh and yeah. It knows your weaknesses, and it it, it played havoc on me for about a month after I left there, and I've seen it do that to other people, and a lot of people it's happened to. You start getting um, EVP, EVPs and things of that nature that are mimicking loved ones of yours. Oh, no. You know it's not your loved one. Right. You know it's not your father or your mother or your grandmother. You Mm -hmm. know it's not. Right. Why would they be there? And it it does that, man. It's it's, it's a bad, bad spot. Well, this brings me to my next question. When you go on these investigations, do you feel like your equilibrium is off? Um, I personally sometimes carry a headache, and nausea afterwards, I actually have to leave the building or lay down on the ground. Anything like that happen to you? Um, I think everybody reacts a little bit differently. Um, the way I react when I go into some of these locations, when I when one of my sensors goes off is that I know a place is, is active or something is going on, I get really flush. Like flush, around my okay. eyes, yeah. I feel like I almost have a fever. Uh, or like I'm starting to get sick, and I don't know if it's just you know a, a, a sensory thing or something, but I can feel it, man. And when I start feeling that, I know this place is is it's going to pop off. Now I've been in locations before too that are, are very active, and I've never and I haven't felt anything. Mm-hmm. So, but some of these locations I go into, you can you you get that 
you you just feel it, man. I think everybody actually reacts a little bit different. There's we all have that that you know that third eye, if you, if you want to call it, and right. um, it's just some people. It's just how you, your body reacts to it. And um, I've seen people like you know people who are sensitive and things of that nature really go in. They start seeing flashes of stuff. I don't see anything. I just feel it. And um, yeah, sometimes you got to get out of there, man, and ground yourself. You really do. You got to get out of the building, mm-hmm. get some fresh air, regroup, ground yourself, and then if you can get back in there, then do it. Um, but yeah, that's one of the best things to do. If you get like that, just get out of the building. Just get out of there, get some air, ground yourself, and then reapproach it in a different way. Yeah. I know that feeling. I wish I had one of those gifts. I mean, all I got is I can use is intuition. I'm not a sensitive. I'm not an empath. That's all her. You get to have all that. I know. Yeah. And sometimes I have nightmares because of it. Night terrors? Yeah. Yeah, that that's that's a whole other story right there. She has night terrors. Night. And oh, it, yeah. And it can be from the location that we investigate or we know that we're going to go to that location. I'll have, I don't know what you call premonition dreams, but they're kind of, they make you wake up in the middle of the night. And it's strangely enough, I always wake up between 3.15 and 3.20 with them in the morning. Uh, Okay. All right. Makes sense. Yeah. it's, It's been happening a lot lately. I um, <laughs> but there was there's it's really weird how this happens for her. Um, I was watching Ghost Brothers and they were at the Thornhaven Manor, and mm-hmm. she watched some of it, and then she's like, "I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch it. I, I want to go ahead and go there so we can I can see it for myself." Well, right that night, will you tell them? Well, that night, I had dreams about the location, but it was not anything that the episode had in it. It was something that was not told in the episode that I didn't know about, and then that's when I started doing more research, because I didn't really know a lot about Thornhaven. So I did my own personal research, and I talked to some other teams that had been there investigating, and they told me that... What was in my dreams, they've had experienced it there, but no one has said anything about it. And then you told Dalen, and he kind of explained what you saw is actually kind of what they experienced, but it was not in the show. Yep. So oh, I, wow. Yeah. And so I've gotten in the habit, and no offense towards you guys or anybody out there with the shows, I have limited my watching <laughs> of the shows for the fact that I don't really... I personally don't try to take them personally, but my back mind, my subconscious, see something as a trigger, and then boom, I'm back into the midnight play at 3.15, waking up, getting freaked out by what I just dreamed. Oh, geez. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I mean, mean, that's understandable. Um, I I used to be kind of like that where when I went to a location, I didn't want to know anything about it. Uh, before I went, now I kind of have to. I mean, I, yeah, I have to know what the client, what the client's going through, and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I used to be. I, I didn't want to know anything, and I wanted to do an investigation and then compare notes to what other people have found there mm-hmm. to see if we capture the same thing. But now you can't really on, on, on ghost hunters. You can't really do that because you have a client. This, these are their claims. These are the eyewitnesses, and a you, you try to. You try to debunk some of that if you possibly can. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, mm-hmm. And then you go in and you do your investigation and see if you can capture what they're actually seeing or hearing or feeling. And uh, and then you compile that evidence and you say, okay. And you bring it to the you know you bring it to the client at the end of the case and you're like, all right, this is what we captured. You're not crazy. This is what we found. You know so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know what you're saying, where you, you kind of really don't want to watch the show because you don't want to know much about what's going on there. Yeah. Go in with an open mind. Um, one thing, I don't know if it was in season one or, or if it was your show or not, but I do remember something that's really interesting in how this all works. It, it has to do with poltergeist. Where yeah. I, I think that was in season one, wasn't it? 
Yeah, it was it was actually like the second or third episode of season one, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, once that once the client left, everything went dead. When she came back, it all ramped back up. Yeah, that was a very interesting case because we went in, we investigated, uh, we heard all the, the the there's a lot behind that case. Uh that case was actually on the news at a couple points. Mm-hmm. Um things going on there with, you know, so there was a demon there, and there's this, there's that, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and so we went there. At the point, she had moved out. She, she was in the, in the process of selling the house. So she had already moved into her new house. So we had full rain. There was no, no furniture, nothing in the, in the property. So we go in there. We do our investigation, and we're getting absolutely nothing. Nothing's happening. I mean, it's dead. We're, I mean, we're not even getting this bike on any of our meters nothing so yeah yeah, grant had an idea said hey let's do this let's bring the client back bring her in and see if things change it's like okay yeah that's that's a good idea we should try that and so we all sat in there we were in different parts of the the house it wasn't a very big house small Mm -hmm. house yeah so i think we was me and kristen were in the kit actually me and kristen were in a back room uh, Brandon and Mustafa were in the basement, and Brian and Rochelle were on the top floor, which is kind of like an attic in a bedroom. And so the clients didn't know where we were in the, in the property. And so Grant goes out, gets her, brings her in, and gets her into the house. And what we did was we decided we were going to try, it, it, we were going to, try to irritate her a little bit to right. see if things kind of get weird mm-hmm. so he was yeah he was kind of like you know pushing buttons with her you know to say hey yeah i don't think anything's going on here and this and that and she started to get a little angry mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden like our tri fields and our data recorders everything starts going off in different parts of the house at the same time so <clears throat> get her into a room and they didn't show a whole lot of that on the show, but you know, we were in there talking to her for a while. It was Grant, myself, Kristen, and a couple of other people. And certain things are going are happening in different parts of the house. Mm-hmm. And as soon as we pour out of there, it all stopped. Yep. So we came to the conclusion that she was causing the paranormal activity in the house. Um, and that's the that that's that's a real thing and no one knows how it works no one knows we just know it usually it's a it's definitely usually a female that it happens usually a female you know middle age um you know 40 50 60 somewhere in there and or an adolescent you know going through puberty right and um she was at the age where you know it it was the the perfect storm almost and we she was actually causing the paranormal activity. Now she's in her new house now. So when we sat down with her, it was at our new house. And the thing was, we told her, said, you know, we asked her, is there anything going on here? No, nothing's going on here. So, okay, cool. Let's keep it that way. And we told, we explained to her what was going on, mm-hmm. why. And we explained to her what a poltergeist was and how it worked. And she thought a poltergeist was, a, was this demonic entity that you from know, the movie she, she didn't understand <laughs> yeah. right and then we explained it to her no you are the poltergeist you are causing this activity you're you're stronger than you know you are right your energy is is making these things happen you know and we explained that to her and from, from what i understand to this date she's i mean this is almost a year ago now she you know she's still she's in good shape in her new house and She's, you know, controlled a lot of the things that were going on in her life where she's not getting these feelings to make these things happen. Mm-hmm. So I've been wondering this, and this is going to sound probably crazy and, and well, hell, it's going to sound crazy. Can guys actually harness this power, too? I'm sure they can. The thing is, with all the... Um, all the research that's been went into with the whole the with poltergeist and that type of thing, it's it always leads to either an adolescent child or a a, a female at a certain age. Um, you know, usually middle age, um, maybe going through menopause, uh, things of that nature. 
and it's always led to that. Uh, I'm sure there is men or males who can actually cause polar polar guys activity. I'm I'm pretty sure it is. I just don't think it's been documented as much or researched. And it's probably something somebody may may want to look into at some point because I think it'd be interesting to find out. Um, it, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, we all have that energy. You know, that third eye where you know you get man enough, man. You know, and you, you got that negative energy around you. So you're carrying this. Say if you're carrying negative energy around you all the time, you're mad all the time. You're upset <laughs> at everything in life. There's nothing good in life. It's going to cause more negative stuff to happen in your life. It's going to be a domino effect. Right. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the you know with that type of kind of activity happening. I'm not saying all activities like that. Definitely not. I've seen investigations you know where there's been an entity in the house and it's not happy that you're there or it's not happy that the homeowner lives there or where they're investigating i've seen that firsthand i just had a habit to me about a month ago so Mm -hmm. yeah that's but the the polar guys thing i mean it's it's, you you don't come across it all the time on the show we only come across it once that i can remember Mm -hmm. and that was in season one so yeah i mean it's interesting i i've read books on it over the years and it's it, it dates back, man. Uh, the whole poltergeist thing dates back to like Roman times. They've been, you know, documenting this type of stuff. So right, it's it's a, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's 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 so crazy to think about. But you know, people you know have a they, they're stronger than they they know. We, we don't we're not using our complete capability as a human being. Yeah, you know, we're probably using maybe six to maybe 12 percent of our of our brain mass and and so i mean god knows if you were able to use everything that your your every little particle you know electro or electron or whatever in your brain can you imagine what you could do the things you could do i it, it blows my mind but yeah I'm, I'm thinking yeah there's maybe should be a study at some point you know checking in to see if men can you know har- harness that type of energy i'm sure they can well, see, the reason why I brought that up is because ever since we've been investigating the paranormal, I mean, we've been doing it for what? Before we did Truth or Legend, we did we, this six is our years? Eight. Eight years? This is our eighth year. Jesus. Ever since we've been investigating the paranormal for eight years, if I get highly pissed off, I mean, if, if something happens, I'm working on a project and the computer crashes or the program crashes. I mean, I start clenching my fists in total rage, and shit flies off our walls. Yeah, so that right there. I mean, that's something maybe you should be documenting. Well, I, I kind of at first thought maybe it just fell, but she saw sh- stuff go flying off the wall when I was pissed. You remember that? Yeah, and certain things will happen around when you're mad. Too. Oh yeah, I, I'll not have... just things on fire. I mean, we've had like. The lights would flicker. I had, oh, check this out. I had the fan in the living room, It uh, the light fixture on it. It shorted out during one of the storms, and I could put light bulbs in it, and it would never turn on. And, uh-huh. I, and the wiring's fine. But there was one day I was totally, totally pissed off. I was in the living room. I was about to throw something, and the light went on. There you go. And it's worked <laughs> ever people, since. And, and the light's on now. It's, it, it's worked ever since. And then something happened last night. I think it's just really bizarre. We have a fan in our bedroom that stopped working. I mean, totally failed. And we just got done watching TV, ready to go to bed. I'm laying down, and I notice out the corner of my eye that the fan's moving. And I look up at it, and I'm going, the fan's moving. And she's like, oh, oh my God. God, so she goes. I dare you to turn it on. I'm like, I'm scared. <laughs> yeah, because it was turned off and it hasn't worked in almost two years. Yeah. So all of a sudden, I turn it on, and it starts spinning the opposite direction, which is the correct way for the fan to blow. So when it was turning, it was turning the op different direction than it's supposed to go. Oh gee. And now the fan's working just fine. It's weird. I guess I guess I had to get pissed more often, huh? <laughs> so that's kind of kind of crazy. But how do you feel today about people being more open to the paranormal compared to 
20 to, say, 25 years ago. Do you believe the TV shows are helping it to be a more open subject? I do. I do a lot. Um, the reason is because I remember, um, I remember 10, 15 years ago when I first started getting into this and really uh, delving into it, um, that people were, you're, you're, as me as an investigator, I was kind of like more shy to talk about it. And now it's very open. Even before I got on the show, it's very open. I, I would talk about it. And then it's crazy. Like all of a sudden, all these people, you know, chime in and they're like, and it's cre- everybody, everybody that, that finds out who I am or knows who I am, they all have a paranormal story. No matter if they're a non believer, believer, and investigator, never investigated a day in their life, they all have that story of their, their aunt's house, their grandmother's house, their mm-hmm. house, somebody, their best friend's house that was haunted. And this is what happened to them. And I tell you, it's, it's funny. You 10 years ago, you didn't get that. And now you do. It, it's funny that so many people are open to it. So many people, I mean, you're starting to see it. right now. I mean, it's still in its infant stages. It really is. And, it's still a pseudoscience, and hopefully someday it becomes a science if you mm-hmm. start taking it more seriously. Um, that's one thing I can say about this show and about the people I work with, not just the team, mm-hmm. the crew, producers, all the way into L.A., the producers in L.A. This is all about, for us, integrity anymore. It's all about bringing integrity to the field and trying to make it, trying to bring that integrity to TV right. and show it to the people and say, Hey, this is what you have. Um, you tell me, I'm not going to try to tell you the belief. I want you to, you know, I want you to look at it yourself and see what you think and make a decision on your own. But mm-hmm. I think if we can move it out of a pseudoscience into a science, eventually, I don't know if it's going to happen today, tomorrow or 10 years from now, hopefully sooner than that, um, that, people will start taking it more seriously and you'll start seeing more people on the scientific side of it start really delving into it and trying to figure out life after death because it's there, guys. You know, us as investigators and ghost hunters or whatever you want to call each other, we know it's there. We wouldn't be doing this. We wouldn't be running out in the middle of the night, hanging out in, in abandoned locations and you know, doing EVP sessions if we didn't know it was real because we've had those experiences. We've called mm-hmm. the EVPs. We've seen the shadow figures. We've captured things on camera or we've seen things through our own eyes and personal experiences. We know it's there. Um, and we're just trying to bring it to the table and say, hey, guys, you guys need it. People in the scientific field, engineers, scientists, whoever, need to start looking at it more seriously so we can maybe understand it better. And that way... You know, some at some point in our lives, and I'm hoping with this show and the direction it's going in, that people are going to start taking it more seriously. And it's not just a bunch of guys running out in black t-shirts, right. hanging out in a, a, a haunted <laughs> building trying to find demons. It's not what it's about. <laughs> oh, Brandon that, was on that. Ah, Brandon yeah. was on that kick too. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're actually investigators we're investigating we're trying to help a client Mm -hmm. but at the same time bring this stuff to the to the table put it on tv say this is what we captured you decide what you think about it and make a decision but we know this is the data we've captured this is the data we've logged this is the stuff we captured on on either camera on audio whatever and here it is you do with it what you want to now. Now we're going to keep working on it and we're going to keep trying to make it better and better and better. Every episode and every season, you're going to see that. Right on. The biggest question everybody asks, they ask me and we usually ask uh, our guests too, but why is it that paranormal investigating takes place at night? <laughs> Well, I can tell you on our end, the reason we do it at night is for IR and thermal. Because mm-hmm. with your thermals and your IRs and things of that nature, plus um, you're, you're not getting all the interference 
and, and things of that nature. Um, there's less traffic on the road. There's less people out. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why a lot of times we're doing investigation. You can do an investigation during the day. I've done investigations during the day where I've got just as much as I did at night. Mm-hmm. But the reason we do it for these shows, especially for ghost hunters, is you know you're, you're filming everything in IR because you yep. can capture things better on IR. You're filming things in thermal because trying to get thermal hitch you can't do that during the day in, in broad in broad daylight oh yeah no um, i mean the evps and stuff of that nature you can do that any time of day but once again you don't have all the background noise and all the interference and things of that nature um with cars and things going you know if you're if the, if the location is close to a road you don't have all that right so that's a lot of just and it, it does add to the ambiance of the show definitely it makes it scarier absolutely but um that's the reason, as uh, as investigators, why we do it. Uh, not so much to add to the ambiance of the show, which it does look great, but we can capture more things. We really can. Mm-hmm. That kind of throws out the whole idea of investigating Sloth's furnace at night, huh? Yeah, I actually uh, had the. Um, I was actually it's crazy. We were we were we were in Birmingham. We were filming right outside of Birmingham. Let. Last season, yeah. Uh, well, beginning of this season, and um, I was at a hotel. Our hotel was located, and I was didn't even know it. I was, my hotel was right next to Floss Furnace. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I get on the road. I'm like, I'm looking at this. And I'm like, where did I know this place from? And like, and Grant was like, that's Floss Furnace. I've been there before. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I know you've been there before. That's Floss. He's like, yeah, that's Floss. <laughs> I'm like, dude, why are we there? <laughs> He's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because it's out in the open, and you've got the roads right there. It just constantly has traffic going back and forth. It's kind of hard to actually get EVPs out there. I, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around how people can actually get clear, audible EVPs at Sloss Furnace when it is out in the open, right next yeah. to the highway. Yeah, I, I that was my same question with Grant. I was like, Grant, okay, you've been best as I know other people have been best as Sloss. I said, I mean, you got this major highway right next to it. It's like sitting at the bottom of the highway, basically, mm-hmm. it's an overpass. I said, how do you, how do you, I mean, how's that work with the investigating? <laughs> he, he, said, he said, really, man? He said, when we were there, he said, you couldn't hear anything. He said, we, you couldn't hear the traffic above. Wow. I said, I was like, okay. He, he said it was, it was, he said he, they thought it was going to be hard, too. But uh, he said it wasn't. It was, it was very easy. I mean, it's like, I, I mean, I basically live for, uh, 30 minutes from Fort Mifflin, which is right outside of Philadelphia. Uh-huh. And Fort Mifflin is an amazing location. I, 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 I have the opportunity to go in there pretty soon. But um, my plane, when I fly in from location, my plane actually is about two, 300 feet above Fort Mifflin when we're landing. Oh, I wow. can look out my window and look right down to the fort, depending on which direction I'm coming from, especially if I'm coming uh, from the south. Like, if I've been filming down south and we're coming out of Texas and we're flying into Philly. And I'm like, how do does, how does they investigate there? And they're like, uh, we do it between flights. <laughs> <I'm> like, oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> we need to, to do some forts. Um the only thing we've actually done was uh, Fort Donaldson, and what was the other fort we did? We did Columbus Belmont. Co- uh, Columbus Belmont. We've done that one. And of course, we've been to Gettysburg. Oh, okay, cool. So, I mean, forts are kind of cool to do. Um, I sw- Something really bizarre and weird happened to us over at um, Columbus Belmont. There was, we were upstairs in the attic, and uh, they were looking at the pictures up there. And just, I was just like, so, is this you in the picture? And all of a sudden, my watch fell and hit the floor. And when I picked it up and looked oh. at it, you could see a nice, clean cut where it got cut off my wrist. So, I'm like, oh. this was cut off my wrist. It just didn't just fall apart. It got cut. Go downstairs to uh, the museum area, and I'm using the Eddie or the MF1, and I'm ho- basically holding it up, and if it detects high EMF, it'll glow light blue, or bright blue. We got to the section where there was a bayonet on the wall, and the, the MF1 glue blue. And uh, I was like, so 
Is this the bayonet that cut my uh, watch off my wrist? And the thing went blue again. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Damn. So, wow. that is really bizarre and weird. I have never had anything like that happen before. I mean, it, it's a clean, clean cut. At first, I thought maybe the little pin fell out, so it just dis detached itself from the watch. No, <laughs> it's still attached with the little loop with the um, the, the little lip thing going through it, the, the, um, the wrist piece going through the, the loop, cut in half. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I could, I can't explain that one. That was just totally bizarre. So I got an interesting one. Not with with the show because I know that you guys can actually go back and refilm if you have to. But when you were with your old team, were there any locations where you actually filmed? I mean, investigated and filmed, came out of the place, and all your footage was trash. Um, no, 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 not, no, not to my knowledge, never Lucky. happened. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the Farrar Elementary School, and uh, we had some crazy activity out there. This is uh, in Maxwell, Iowa, and all the activity that we filmed, I mean, I did walk out of there with, I kid you not, a phantom basketball game playing. Okay. And uh, the reason how that happened is I just had a regular... Uh, we, we're using a box called the Devil Jersey Box, and we hook a radio to it, which totally wipes out all the radio stations completely. It is nothing but static. Now, Brandon told me you have to throw that out because you're still going to get radio frequencies, but... Believe it or not, we right. ha we had nothing. We had nothing but white noise on this because that's how Katie Stafford made this radio. No radio frequency uh -huh. whatsoever. Just straight up white noise generator plugged into the Six. Devil Jersey box. And all of a sudden, we are talking to Craig, which is uh, the writer, and he's actually investigated there. He said when they first came there the first time, they were woke up at about... 11.30, 11.45, midnight, something like that. What well, well, sounded like somebody playing a basketball game down in the gymnasium. They all jumped up, ran downstairs, flung the door open to be greeted by nothing but darkness. And, of course, the basketball game stopped. Now, we're there. He's telling us that. And all of a sudden, on the Devil Jersey box, we're hearing what sounds like a basketball game going on right then and there. And he looked at me and he goes, that's what we heard down in the gymnasium. I'm like, really? So we're listening to it. So I'm like, okay, let's test the theory. I'm going to pick this up and we're going to go inside. And he's like, no, it, it, it's going to stop. It, it's going to stop. Down the stairs, it's still going. Open up the gymnasium doors, it's still going. I placed the double jersey box down in the middle of the floor. The basketball game is still going. with, And it's totally blowing my mind. I put a digital recorder on a big wheel. Don't ask me why there's a big wheel in there, but there is. Shut up, dog. Sorry. <laughs> dog doesn't know when to shut up. <laughs> so, um, the game is still going. I put my digital recorder down. I put one uh, Sony AX53 on one side of the court and then a 53 on the other side of the court with night vision on. So I am actually filming what's going on here, and it's recording the basketball game. So I said, okay, I'm going to test a theory here. Call me crazy, but I'm going to do it. I put the MF1 on one side of the court, and then I went and put the Phantom Vibe, which is another version of the Geophone, on the other side of the court. While the game is playing, you're listening. You can hear people running up and down on the bleachers. You can hear the slam dunks. You can hear the squeaking of the sneakers. You can hear the announcer. But the weirdest thing, really? there was no cheering whatsoever. Nothing. And you could huh. even hear the pep band start in. Now, this is where it gets hairy. The geophone starts ticking up on the left side of the court. And it goes all the way on up. And then when it disappears all the way down, on the right side of the court... The geophone's going up. Oh, wow. 
Wow. So it's like they are going back and forth, back and forth, playing basketball. And I'm recording this on two cameras. We have like four witnesses that saw this amazing phenomenon happening right in front of us. And needless to say, when we left the location, all the footage was shot. 768 gigabytes of corrupted footage. Oh, you were talking about your footage being yes. uh, messed up. I thought you had equipment. No, uh, footage. Yeah, I've, I've been <laughs> the locations where, like, you know, we, we filmed stuff, not on the show, but we filmed stuff for hours and hours with mm-hmm. lockdown cameras. We walked out, and, like, 90% of it's gone. Yeah, yeah, I've had that happen. Oh, man, that, that totally blew my mind. I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. We had, like, the best evidence ever. I mean... Paula would try to be a bad girl there in the same area where Chad Lindbergh ran. And uh, uh-huh. she started saying, I'm I'm the big bad girl. I'm running on down the hall. She goes to the principal's office and she's like, what are you going to do about it? And she wound up getting what appeared to be a ruler slap on her hand, on top of her hand. And you could see the, the rectangle would look like a freaking uh-huh. ruler on the top of her hand. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Oh, we had so yeah. much. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> but, um, well, I tell you what, man, we've been on for about an hour, so I'm going to go ahead and let you have the floor where you can tell our listeners where they can find you, um, if you have a website, any current events that are coming up, and uh, basically what you got planned. So the floor is yours. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, definitely the biggest thing is, I mean, guys, uh, season two, Ghost Hunters, A&E, um, April 8th, comes on at 8 p.m. to uh, 10 p.m., two-part special. Um, it's one entire location we did. We were there for two weeks filming. Amazing, amazing, amazing. I can't wait till you guys see it. Uh, then, uh, you, you know, all my social media, you can go check me out at Daryl Marson, Ghost Hunters, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Uh, yeah, and you also have my uh, my website at, at, at www.darylmarson.com. Um, you can go in there, check on all the different events I'm at. I'm all over the place doing stuff right now. A lot of stuff has been kind of postponed because of all the you know, activity going on with the virus, uh, but it's all being rescheduled as we speak. And um, hey, guys, man, thanks uh, for tuning in. And no, don't forget April eighth. It's going to be amazing. It's going to it's going to change a lot of people's view on the paranormal, and I can't wait. Oh, man, no doubt. I can't wait to. We're going to be totally psyched, ready to watch it, aren't we? (laughs) So, man, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Um, We'll go ahead and do this again. Have me on. Hey, not a problem. Uh, We'll we'll go ahead and do this again uh, later on, uh, probably when you guys rock on out with Season 3. Is there any word on that? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, We're... we're I'm sure it will. I'm, right, right now, everything is just so crazy with this virus. Um, God knows, uh, but I'm sure we'll be picking up pr- pretty soon here, maybe sometime in the spring, and starting to film season three, hopefully, and uh, it'll be amazing again, and bigger locations, and I'll tell you what, man, it's, it's been a crazy ride, and I can't wait to get back out there and start investigating and bringing this to the, to the show so you guys can see it. Right on, right on. Mm-hmm. All right, man, well... You keep your family family faith. Uh, yeah, let me try that again. You keep your family safe and keep yourself safe, and hopefully you don't get this virus and this thing will really blow over, so we all can go back to our regular life. Well, right. As it, by the Absolutely. way, I have Everybody. to ask, what's your prediction on this virus? Prediction. As oh, in, how prediction. long it's going to take believe, to run its course? I, believe, I mean, quite honestly, guys, I believe. It's going to eventually blow over. I, I can't say when, of course, but um, I think it's going to change a lot of things, and especially in this country, the way things are, are are done with travel, with you know, air air travel and just travel. Period, especially overseas. Mm-hmm. I think you're going to it, it's going to change some things. I think we're going to get back on our feet, and we're going to you know, and everybody's going to be okay, and it's going to blow over. I do think there'll be. Um, new things are put into uh, perspective as far as testing and things of that nature. And, yeah, I think we're going to be just fine. I really do. I really do. I feel good about it. And I think um, this quarantine thing is going to be a good thing. 
It's mm-hmm. going to slow it down, and that way, you know, the government or the CDC can get their their hands around it. And we got some great people out there working on it and trying to figure things out. So, um, yeah, I think it'll be all right, guys. Well, we can only hope so. <laughs> so, on that note, we're going to go ahead and. Uh, call it a night we got a dog totally driving us nuts yeah he's being impatient now. <laughs> he's being very impatient he wants someone to play fetch <laughs> God. That's all, good. all right guys all right man well, you have your s- no problem uh, we'll talk to you uh, later have yourself a good rest of the evening have enjoy your night uh, you too guys See all right bye-bye, mm, bye-bye. Fantasmic Journey Podcast is brought to you by Tascam and Amazon Studio. For more than 30 years, Tascam has developed products for every segment of the sound and music industry. From the high-end audio professional in a major post-production studio to the novice of hobbyists at home, Tascam is everywhere. They are a company committed to providing their customers audio and video solutions that enable breakthroughs by using sound in ways that are exciting as they are accessible, even recording the voices of the dead. You ask for a non-scripted paranormal TV show. You begged for a non-staged paranormal TV show. You begged and you pleaded, and we have listened. We present to you Season 1 of The Paranormal Journey to the Unknown. It was released October 31st, 2017. In this series, we show you what it's like behind the scenes and conducting a real paranormal investigation. Join Gavin Kelly, Paul Purcell, and their special guests to seek out the existence of life after death by going to numerous haunted locations such as jails, hospitals, battlefields, and museums, collecting compelling evidence evidence by means of video, photography, and EVPs. In this season, the crew investigates the St. Albans Sanatorium, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, Jailhouse Pizza, and the famed Monroe House. And you can watch season one of The Paranormal Journey into the Unknown on Amazon.com right now. Season two and three will be coming soon. All right, I hope you guys enjoyed the show tonight. Join us next week. Let's see the date. It will be March 25th. And we will be joined by none other than Mustafa Gadalari. Once again, continuing our trek with talking with A&E's Ghost Hunters. Everyone, I bid you a good night. Stay safe. Stay away from the virus. Wash your hands. And take it easy.